My name is Kia Brooks. I'm the Associate Director of Sales and Operations here at the Made in NY Media Center by IFP. Um, for those of you who are not aware or have not been here before, we are a collaborative workspace for media and tech entrepreneurs, innovators, and artists that was started in partnership between the Mayor's Office of Media Entertainment and the EDC. Uh, we provide entrepreneurs with workspace, access to business development resources, classes, programs, and events. Um, and we're really happy to have you guys here today. So I'm going to introduce Errol Lewis to continue the conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Kia, and uh, thank you for making the space available. I actually um, was coming here uh, quite a bit over the last few summers. My son was in a film program that happened to be based here, and uh, I can tell you it's a very um, energetic and creative place. So for those who have uh, either workers or even want to try it out yourselves, it's a, it's a really good space, good people, lots of food, convenient, all that good stuff. Um, thank you, thank you for being here. The uh, Center for Community and Ethnic Media, of course, is um, a, a leading uh, source of uh, information and often authentic communication with the communities that make New York great. Uh, we normally meet at the Craig Newmark uh, Graduate School of Journalism at CUNY, and um, it's nice to get out a little bit and. Uh, come back home to Brooklyn for just a little bit. We've got about an hour, so I want to use the time really as efficiently as possible. I want to um, thank Jahangir uh, Kadek and um, Karen Pinar for uh, putting this together. When they approached me, I've been through a couple of uh, charter commissions. This might be my third or fourth, actually. I remember testifying at one back in the 80s. Um, but this is an important and often overlooked part of how the city runs. And so for all the CCEM members uh, that made it out, this is not gonna be your last time having to wrestle with this stuff. This uh, often gets overlooked, but it's extremely important. And so you're gonna hear some really important information that we need to convey to all of our audiences. Just by way of background, and I'm sure some of our panelists are going to re-emphasize this. The, uh, the city charter is sort of like the U.S. Constitution is for the country, except it's much easier to change the charter here in New York. It also is more of an administrative code. If you ever look through the charter, you'll find that there are some su surprisingly specific things that are in it about how the operations of the city should take place. There are multiple ways to change, to amend or update the charter, and this happens to be one of them. The city council can change the charter at times. There are other ways to do it. Uh, but one of the most basic ways, the thing that we're here to talk about today, is the means by which a commission is impaneled, can uh, take testimony, hear from experts, make proposals, and then put it before the voters. And that is going to happen on election day in November. So it's really important that we understand uh, how they got to the point of um, making some specific recommendations. We need to convey what those recommendations are to our various audiences, help them to understand what's at stake so that they in turn can uh, intelligently make a final choice when the uh, election comes around in November. So we have several members of the commission here, the, the Charter Revision Commission here, I'm going to uh, introduce all of them and then turn it over to the executive director who, who has a short presentation about what they've been up to and uh, how all of this is going to work. I have some questions for them. We'll have a bit of a conversation. And as always, we'll leave time to take your questions to make sure everybody goes out of here clear on what they've seen and what this all means. So uh, from your right to left, the uh, commission members, our panelists today, uh, Angela Fernandez is the Executive Director and Supervising Attorney of Northern Manhattan Coalition for Immigrant Rights. They are a community-based legal services and advocacy organization for low-income immigrants. She also serves on the New York City Civilian Complaint Board. Next to her is Marco Carrion. He's the Commissioner of the Mayor's Community Affairs Unit, which connects City Hall with communities around the city, especially in the outer boroughs um, prior to serving as Commissioner. He was the political and legislative director for the New York City Central Labor Council. 
Uh, next to him is um, uh, our own Brooklyn's own, uh, Una Clark. She's the president of Una Clark Associates. She always was the kind of person who had her name on her business card. The name was the title, uh, the title was the name, the title was the mission, and uh, we are so glad to have her. Uh, it's a consulting firm that specializes primarily in education management, political consultant, and small business services. Prior to that, of course, she made history as a New York City Council member, representing the 40th District for 10 years, and uh, sponsored more than 300 pieces of legislation, and has been through uh, a charter commission or two uh, in the past as well. Uh, and then also with us is Matt Gawal, the executive director of the commission and, uh, and council as well. He's the assistant dean and general counsel of New York Law School, where uh, he advises the dean and the president and the members of the board and the senior administration of the school on policy. He was previously the legislative director of the New York City Council, so he too knows quite a lot about how all of this works. And uh, Matt, I'll ask you to start by taking us through uh, the brief version of, uh, of the commission, the various hearings that you've held, and uh, the proposals that are likely to find their way onto the ballot in November. Thanks, and thanks so much to all of you, the CUNY Center for Community and Ethnic Media, the Made in New York Media Center, we're, we're so glad to be here. Um, I'm gonna do the brief version, I promise, of how we got here, and then run through uh, what the proposals are that we're currently working on together with our commissioners, and then, and then um, throw it back. So the uh, Charter Revision Commissions can be impaneled in, in different ways. We're in an interesting period now where we've had one that's been created by city council legislation. This particular commission is the one that was created um, by, uh, by Mayor de Blasio. So we are the Mayoral Charter Revision Commission and we started our work um, at the, the and it, at the end of the, the winter, beginning of the, of the spring, when the commission members were, were appointed by the mayor, we have gone and done um, a couple of rounds of borough hearings. That's generally how these, have, these commissions have been done in the past. So we visited each borough multiple times to hear from city residents about um, issues relating to the charter or, or, charter or, or any other issues they, they care to to the commission. We then, based on the feedback that we got, held a variety of issue forums. So this is where we invited experts, academics, members of advocacy organizations to come and talk to the commissioners about particular issue areas. So some of those issues this time around were, were campaign finance, um, ranked choice voting, we'll talk about that in a little bit, and, and some issues relating to democracy in the city. We then published a preliminary staff report that's laid out some staff level analysis of the various proposals, did another round of borough hearings, which we concluded, did some additional staff work, and um, the commissioners have just recently met earlier this week and approved a resolution setting forth you know, from an, in, a broad, in a broad way um, what they would like us from a staff perspective to draft uh, as, as legislative proposals for them to then consider sometime before September 7th when all of this in uh, ballot form or ballot proposal form is due to the city clerk and then would appear on the ballot in the general election. So it's, a, it's a bit of a whirlwind tour. Uh, we're glad to answer questions about the process um, in a moment, but I wanted to tell you about the substance a little bit. Um, Campaign finance, so this is a little bit of a, a history of, of the campaign finance system in the city. But I'll say that briefly, yeah, as you may be aware, the city has a matching funds program, which is widely seen as a model and very successful, where if you choose to participate as a candidate running in a municipal election, you can have a certain amount of money that you raise matched with public dollars. And the idea is that if you, um, th that a system like this can um, work against corruption or the perception of corruption in the political system. So I'm gonna stand, if that's all right. Um, we have, or the commissioners have directed us to draft legislative language that would 
decrease the contribution limits, the amount of money that people are able to contribute to candidates, and increase the matching ratio. So that's the amount of money um, that candidates would receive in public funds when they raise small dollar contributions. There's a couple of other pieces of campaign finance which we're glad to talk about in more detail, but uh, I'll move ahead just to conserve time. Um, civic engagement. This was another big piece. We heard in, in, all of, in all of the boroughs from a wide range of people the desire to be more engaged with civic life in the city. And so the commissioners have directed us to prepare ballot language that would do a couple of things. So first, it would establish a new city, um, excuse me, civic engagement commission. The commission would be responsible for a couple of things, but there's a couple of really exciting new big programs that we wanted to highlight. The first would be um, citywide participatory budgeting. Some of you may be aware of participatory budgeting that, current, that currently happens now on a um, council district basis, where council members can opt to participate. The commission heard a lot of testimony from people in all five boroughs that, people, that all city residents wanted this opportunity, and so we're going to be directing um, the establishment of a new city participatory budgeting program. The other one that I want to just highlight before moving on is providing technical assistance, including urban planning services, to community boards. This was a big, uh, big issue for community board members who came to hearing after hearing to ask us to provide particular um, urban planning expertise to make that more available to them. And so one of the things that the commission will do is be responsible for providing that urban planning expertise. A little more with civic engagement, supporting and partnering with community-based <coughs> organizations, and encouraging, promoting, and facilitating voter registration. And we talked a lot about in, during this process about voter registration assistance. There's some really interesting and innovative programs going um, on with community organizations and, and different places in the city, like the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs, and this will bring those together and enhance them. Um, and we're almost through community boards, another big area. So I, I think this is probably second to campaign finance, the area where we heard the most testimony across the city. And so we're proposing a couple of things relating to community boards. The first is to establish a limit of four consecutive full two-year terms. So there would be effectively an eight-year uh, time period where community board members could serve. There would be term limits, so that's the same number of years, for instance, as a council member. Then uh, they'd have to sit out for two years, and they'd be eligible to come back. And what we heard across the city is that there's an enormous desire um, for the community boards to reflect the diversity of communities, and they don't always do that. Um, so the idea with these proposals, or this one, term limit proposal in particular, is that by imposing term limits and having the borough presidents who are the ones that appoint with some advice from council members, the community board members go through um, this process and have term limits that um, new folks will get an opportunity to serve uh, their community in this way. And um, we also have a couple things, uh, apologies for, for being brief, but again, we can talk about it much more if you're interested. Um, a couple other things about the appointment process. So it's often difficult to figure out how to apply to a community board. It can sometimes be unclear what criteria are used to select community board members, to evaluate the candidacy. And so in addition to the community board resources, in addition to term limits, um, we're saying there needs to be a little bit more transparency around these processes. You need to tell us, the members of the public, what's going on in the appointment or recruitment process. And language access. Um, this area is tied into a lot of the other areas, but essentially what we're saying, and this, the, the Civic Engagement Commission would be largely responsible for this in coordination with the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs, is that language access has to be a part of all of these proposals, particularly that we're trying to engage the community, and so there'll be um, new requirements relating to it in the charter. Next steps. So here's what's coming. Um, August and September of this month, so the commission is about to hold a public meeting to discuss a final report. So that'll be within the next couple of weeks. We'll be noticing that meeting 
um, probably within the next day or so, so that um, the commissioners can consider specific ballot language. So far, they've considered and approved these proposals in, in, in broad terms. They'll now get to consider a final report of specific ballot language, and they'll approve that, uh, hopefully. Hopefully, we'll, we'll, we'll get there. I think we will. Um, by September 7th, any proposals that the commissioners do approve are due to the city clerk. And um, September to November is when there'll be public education and outreach. So the commission will be reaching out to communities across the city in various ways, hoping to um, talk to them about this process and engage folks um, on these issues. And then November 6th uh, will be election day and hopefully, or and the voters will decide on, on any proposals that we, that we put up. As I know, we're all in. Okay, that was a uh, very, very succinct. I have a couple of questions for you, Matt. What, okay. what um, uh, first of all, are there are the community hearings over? Are the uh, the, the the borough? You know, I, I saw at least five, one in each borough. Is that is that is it is that it for now? Yeah. So we did two rounds of of five. So two visits to each borough. Um, so that is over. Though folks can continue to submit. We're continuing to review testimony. Um, through through the website or through mail or, or any other means. One one of the proposals involves um, a districting commission or would have um, some impact on how lines are drawn. So say say a little bit about that. There have been proposals to change the way that the city draws lines for council districts. Um, the commission decided at the latest meeting on Tuesday that that was a the issue was really compelling to them, um, and it's definitely something that, that people want to continue to look at. For the purposes of, of this election day, they deferred um, further consideration of districting proposals. And the idea is that, I and mean, what we heard from the commissioners on, on Tuesday was that, again, really interesting proposals need a little more time to, to review those and to engage with some stakeholders. This was a pretty fast process. Um, but there's going to be a recommendation in the final report that future commissions, whether existing or to be appointed, really take a hard look because it's it's a it's an important mission. Gotcha. Um, well, Commissioner Clark, the the years that you were in the city council, you appointed um, many many members to various community boards. I wonder if you could say a word about what you think the benefits would be of of having term limits. Um, the benefit would be that as the community grows, so would be the members on the um, community board. There are many communities in which there are new residents who don't have a say in the community. So whether you look at, well, in my case, I am the product of a charter revision. In 89, when the charter was revised and the council moved from 35 members to 51 members, I became one of those 51 members, and it is because the Caribbean American community was growing. We had no voice. We owned a lot in the community, but then we couldn't get on community boards. We weren't able to do a lot. Everybody wanted to speak for us, and we felt it was time that we speak for ourselves. And I think in this charter revision, what we're trying to do is to give voice um, to every resident of the city of New York who desire to serve their community and be a part of that community, that we open a way for them to do that. And, and this is why this is so important for me. And I come to every meeting because as a immigrant minority, I know how we had to knock down the doors in order to even enter and then to become elected and to be a part of the decision making about the community and its growth and development. And, and a related question, the proposal to have um, planners affiliated with the board to help communities um, engage when different proposals are, are, are being talked about. I know there's been, um, in some cases, I think it was in Manhattan, the, the, the borough president had already taken some steps in this direction, but what, what would that kind of uh, change mean for the community I, board? I, I think it will allow the community to understand the lay of the land, one, what needs to be done in that community in terms of planning its growth and development. 
Everyone screams about gentrification and over gentrification. Um, they didn't know when the buildings were coming up, how it was planned for, but this way if you have planning done, the community will know what the plan is and can have a say before things get out of hand and people have to demonstrate. You demonstrate your strength at the planning and at the community board, and I am one that really advocated that the term limits for community board. Um, I left the city council 15, 20 years ago, and some of the people that I um, appointed during my time, I had to ask my successor and the successor after my successor to consider talking to the borough president to renew those persons so that we can get new input and new insight into what should be happening in the community. Mm -hmm. um, so now, Marco, civic engagement, it, it sounds like it's a major focus of this. Um, is, are we talking about a big bureaucracy? Are we talking about uh, commissioners meeting occasionally? What would it actually look like? So it's, uh, no, I mean, we would not be talking about big bureaucracy. I mean, what we're thinking about here is a body that will be able to coordinate the various activities that are already happening throughout the city, but also, in addition to that, looking at the PB process and also being able to house additional resources for the community board. Um, we have so many agencies that currently are involved in, throughout the civic engagement spectrum that it'd be good to have a focus and one, one really place, one place where folks could enter and find out all the information um, and resources available. And as you know, there are a lot of community groups that really specialize in something like this, sort of community outreach to very specific populations where there's cultural familiarity, language, uh, facility. Um, how would that interact with the, the commission? Yeah, I mean, this administration takes cultural competency very seriously. Um, and we look for this commission to really codify that within the charter to make sure that future administrations um, keep to that standard. Mm -hmm. And, and um, the, the, the agency, as far as you know, or this commission, yeah. where would it be housed on the, on the flow chart? Who would it respond to? That is still, I mean, essentially what you would have is a commission um, with the majority of appointees belong to the mayor other appointees on the commission to the council and borough presidents. But as far as where it will be housed in your chart, I think that that has not yet been determined. That needs to be fleshed out. Okay. Um, and, and so, Angela, when uh, communities hear about this for the first time, what's the, what's the best way or the right way uh, to help them put it in perspective? Because we're, we're going to be we're asking them to go to the polls for the third and fourth times this year. Um, and we're now going to kind of add, and oh, and by the way, while you're voting on, you know, governor and attorney general and state senate and assembly, uh, there's going to be this other thing on the ballot. What's the, what's the right way to sort of um, explain it, I guess? I think first the best way to explain it is that this is a tremendous opportunity for the community to provide input on what's essentially the city's constitution. And whenever we have an opportunity like that, we should ensure, we want to ensure the community understands we're already going to, by the time November comes around, we will already have engaged in a multi two to three month education campaign so that the voters are fully empowered with information as to whether they should vote for or against these proposals. So we take this very seriously and, uh, and I think that that's part of the role that's going to happen also with a lot of the community-based organizations that may be engaged in this um, to make sure that this information is communicated in a way that's culturally competent so that all communities can understand what this charter revision proposals, what they are and how they will impact them. Mm -hmm. And, and what, what's the, the right metric or what's the metric you all are going to use, do you think, to determine whether or not we've, we've collectively done a good job of uh, explaining, informing, and helping to mobilize people for November? So I think um, the metric, the clearest metric will be how many people actually go to the polls in November. And, uh, and I think that's the one, the one clear one. I think the goal during these coming months is to ensure that folks understand why this particular 
election is so critical because one of the few times that the community can actually participate in something like the charter revision. And uh, Matt, a technical question. Can, is this going to come as one question or is it going to be multiple questions? Is this all, all, all up or down or will people be able to pick and choose? When a, a charter revision, revision commission determines how to submit the ballot questions, so uh, it could be one, it could be 10. It typically, in the, in the past, and I think what we anticipate with this commission, is it'll be somewhere in between. So probably um, somewhere around three questions so that you can separate out the discrete uh, subject matter areas and people have a, a chance to do up or down in those areas. And, and it'll, it'll be pretty obvious, like yes, no. I mean, yes. people play a lot of games with that about like, no, we're, should we not do this? <laughs> you know, like, I don't think our, our, our goal, and um, I'll be spending Labor Day weekend writing the ballot questions is to have them be e extremely uh, clear. Okay. I think once we know what the questions are, that we have an opportunity to educate the community, the benefits that it will be for them to um, vote on it um, a yes or a no clearly so that we are aware of what we have what we have said to our New York City residents and that means we will do them in different languages so that um, every, no one is confused about what it is and the benefits it will be to them and to their community so we should be very concise and very clear about what it is it will do to improve the quality of life for us in the city of New York, and as voters that we have the right to be able to understand how our government works and the responsiveness of government to us. Yeah, I, I was asking just because, you know, I, I'm imagining some people may look at it and say, you know, I'm all for civic engagement, but I don't like term limits. You know, there'll, there'll be a lot of different opinions about this. And, and I just wanted to be clear, Matt, the, the, um, the while the districting is going to be sort of, um, set aside for now. The, the question about ranked voting or instant runoff voting is how I was interpreting it. I want to make sure, I'm, um, is, is that going to be anywhere uh, on the ballot? No, that is in a similar category where um, it was, it's going to be discussed at, at some length, at least the, the commissioners have directed us to discuss at some length in the final report, but not on, the, uh, not to, to formulate a ballot proposal. Got it, okay. Um, let me open this up to, to questions, folks. Steve. Yeah. Hi, Steve Nowick from Kings County and Queens County Politics. Um, given the suggestions that are still open, correct? Mm -hmm. uh, given that A, the mayor has vocally said he wants to support local media, and given that he locally wants to support nonpartisan media, and given that the, uh, the campaign finance board by nature is nonpartisan, and anybody that's covered elections sees a lot of that money goes to campaign consultants, right? This could be an excellent opportunity that some of that money go into campaign finance, whether it's, if there's one, if there's eight public dollars to a match to one, maybe one of those dollars should go explicitly to advertising in local media that's locally owned that covers these races. Because I have found that way one, you're supporting the mayor, the administration's goal of supporting local media. Two, you're taking a little bit of the money away from consultants that are tied in with a lot of the campaign finance money. And it, it is a nonpartisan way of the city, as part of the <coughs> charter, supporting local media when right now we're all struggling. And I'm sure everybody here that's part of local media feels if they're covering a local election, that they should, you know, get a little bit of that public finance money. I, I heard, I heard a, uh, an extended uh, version of this proposal over the weekend when I ran into Steve on Eastern Parkway. Um, uh, I mean, it, you know, is he for local media or not? Is there a way we can write this in? Um, okay. So I haven't heard previously proposals to require that kind of expenditure. I, I am imagining now with my lawyer hat on sort of a variety of, of potential obstacles. I mean, it's it's candidly not something we've 
we have considered um, so far during this process, or, or I think received any public comment. On so my first question was, it, it's still open though for suggestions. It is still open, and as I described, um, we did most of the hearing comments already. Um, it is it is potentially possible that that the commissioners could sort of change their posture at this point, but but unlikely. So I mean. Well, then you're having us here like it's a done deal. Is it a done deal or not? Can it no. be done? Let me just take a, a try at it. You have to remember that candidates um, decide who their consultant is going to be. And I think it would be very hard to direct um, to direct the campaign finance board that you must take the local media. I think the local media needs to get into understanding the candidates that's running from their community and say we I can cover the local candidates. Yeah, but I'm just saying I'm just, I'm just saying I'm just saying then the job of the media is to say to the candidate, I can cover you better than anybody else because I'm local and I know the community and I know you. I, again and I just want to say this is public financing tax dollars. The administration has repeatedly said over and over they want to support local media. This is a way they can support local media. I, I guess, I mean, I just want to piggyback on what Matt said. While the commission was, was charged by the mayor, what has been put forth are really responses to concerns and observations by the larger community. So this is not carrying the agenda of the administration. This is actually responding to and answering to concerns that which we which we heard in testimony. So we have not heard this concern. Um, and I think, as Matt said, everyone is still free to turn in testimony. But we have this is the first time that I've ever heard anything so like this. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, to, to, to back up just, just a little bit, one of the proposals, and I know it did get some um, media attention. I saw an article in the New York Post. There's a proposal here to push the uh, matching funds program from six to one to eight to one. Right? I think that's kind of what got a lot of people's attention, that there's going to be a whole lot more money um, coming from the public into local elections, which of course raises the question about, well, where's it going to get spent? Um, one, one thing that uh, Steve and I were, were talking about was um, there's a certain portion of advertising about upcoming elections that's just generated by the board. Uh, and we certainly want community and ethnic media to be, to be tied into that. Um, there's also the idea that just as when you fill out your um, federal tax form, you can check a little box and say, well, do you want to, you know, do you want to make a small contribution to uh, campaign finance at the, the federal level? Some, some version of that might be um, possible for, um, again, for, for local media to, to do what they need to do in order to help um, make the elections work right. And just to add on again, you did mention, sir, in your comments before, for the administration, and now you're like, we're not the administration, which is fine. Yeah. But if, the, if it is a constitution that we're talking about, which is what you mentioned, like a city constitution, and the city wants to be on the cutting edge of, of you know, supporting media, which is a big conversation around the country, with local media being cut out, and like our time press been there 20 years. Who would know better how to cover the bad style elections than our time press, right? It would, it would seem to me it could be incumbent upon the campaign finance board as a bipartisan, nonpartisan entity within the Constitution to delegate, figure a way legally, I don't know the legal jargon, to give a certain amount of money to local media that's covering local elections. And that would be like real cutting edge, cool, progressive, you know, all the catch words you guys love. You know? There is nothing cooler than giving money to community and ethnic media, I can tell you that. <laughs> At least as far as this group is concerned. And to Steve's point, we are the public. We are the community. We're in the community, on the ground, with the community. Is it that, remember where we need to get together and present a proposal to you? 
at this point, and so from a charter vision commission, from this commission's perspective, it is almost definitely too late to do something meaningful in this area. Yeah. So why did you come on? Then you're BS enough. No, 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 no. I, was, I, I think I was pretty clear in the presentation of where we are in the process. However, there is another process going on right now. Um, in fact, I think through September, they are having their borough-based hearings. That's the council-created process. Something like what you're describing could be created legislat legislatively, potentially. I, I, I don't know the details. We have to think about this. Um, it could be done by local. I mean, there are lots of possibilities. I don't think that because our process is, is winding down, just because of when ballot language is due to the clerk, that that means that th this is not something you could pursue or explore. I don't I do know. know. It's late. It's a late suggestion. I'll give you that. But I did ask specifically when I started, is it still open? And you said yes. Yes. The, again, yeah. Well, let me, you know, let, me, let me make a friendly amendment, Steve. Maybe we can look at, in particular, what they've done over in New Jersey, where there is this connection between uh, public government and public funding for local media. We can figure out, maybe um, put some shape to it, and then figure out uh, which place and in what manner we can put it forward as a proposal, as a, as a sector. You had a question? Who can you speak louder, please? No, I'm. Uh, yeah, thanks. That that kind of uh, you know uh, roundtable organized by the ethnic uh, media department in CUNY J School. Thanks, Earl Lewis. Um, you know the uh, this is a new kind of roundtable which I. Uh, I am in, in the covering Bangladeshi community uh, and as well as South Asia. Since 25 years in New York City, we publish a newspaper for Bangladesh community. But this is the first time that Charter Revision Commission, uh, you know, they have a round table. And I think in a New York City ethnic community and community as well, the, in, in New York City is very important. And uh, there is, say about my, if I talk about my community, Bangladeshi community, they are not so aware of the Charter Commission, you know, rules, their obligation, how they can participate. So my question is how you will take initiative to engage the community more with that where they can participate. As he mentioned that advertisement, you know, publicity, uh, how you can throw out your message to the community. So, I think I'll defer to, to my commissioners, but, but would, um, would start by saying that once we <coughs> submit uh, any ballot questions on September 7th, our focus is going to turn to, what Dan was mentioning, um, a, a broad-based community uh, outreach effort to, to talk to uh, city residents about the, the ballot proposals and why we made the choices that we made collectively as a commission. And, and we hope and expect very much that that will include um, conversations with the, with the that you're talking about, but. And, and I think you know what we would hope that we could do is actually work in partnership with all of you. Uh, you're the experts on how to communicate uh, what is what the government is proposing, and to ensure that your readers are actually engaged, are asking the questions, um, uh, and that can come into the ballot uh, that day on in November, informed um, and understanding very clearly what it is they are or aren't voting for. Yes, but they're holding the best trustees. Um, with regard to the planning staff for the community boards, I was wondering if you could elaborate on the decision to house that in the new Civic Engagement Commission as opposed to putting them on the staff of the borough president or community board itself or district managers. Um, I guess, and I guess, is there a concern with having them housed within a, within a commission that's going to be primarily appointed, composed of mayoral appointees, uh, working with? community boards that are sometimes opposed to decisions made by their own agencies. That's a really interesting question. Um, it, it, it's a challenge to figure out where to have, everyone, not everyone, a lot of people came and asked for, and this is a conversation that's been going on for some number of years as well, um, for these kinds of planning resources. The question is where do you put it? The borough presidents have some responsibility and they already do 
have uh, provided some resources to the boards. Um, uh, city planning has some responsibility to provide some resources to the boards. Um, what the boards wanted was uh, resources that were not in city planning necessarily, not with the VPs, but somewhere where um, even if it wasn't fully independent, it felt a little more, uh, that there was a little bit more uh, separation from those entities. So, you know, I don't think there's an ideal location necessarily, but we think that um, the kind of commission that we've created, which will have a mix of mayoral and non-mayoral appointees, is probably the right structure, because it will have some level of independence from those other, or separation from those other bodies, and kind of pro provide um, those kinds of services. Okay. My name is Javier Castaño from Queens Latino. I know that the deadline is September 7th, but do you have an, uh, an idea of a, a question that is going to appear on, I believe it's November 13th? Yes. Um, we, so um, the way that it works is the commissioners uh, this past Tuesday they voted on a resolution that, that doesn't have specific language, it sort of sets forth um, uh, particular principles, like we're lowering the contribution limits from you know, $5,000 to $2,000 for, for citywide races, for instance. Um, so it's our task now, from a staff perspective, for then for the commissioners to approve, to turn those principles into legislative language. It'll look like, like a city council bill. And they will then have to approve that, and then they will also have to approve, going along with that, a ballot question that, where we do our best to describe what that bill does. So they approve the actual legislation, they'll approve um, a short ballot question, and then that ballot question will be approved by them, submitted to the clerk, and that's what the that people will vote on. Yeah, I make this question because probably that's the best way to work out with you guys. Uh, if you give out that, that question, we can write an article about that question because the election is just around the corner. Good point. Uh, David. Um, can you hear me? Okay. Um, I'm just curious in terms of just the, during the, the course of um, you know, discussions with the, the community, whether or not, um, with respect to community boards, whether or not they, you know, on, on its surface, they're supposed to be apolitical, but you have the borough president and you have a council member deciding who goes on the board. It, was there ever a discussion of just taking away that uh, that power from the borough president and the council members, given the fact that they inherently are political and you throw them into the mix? Yeah, I mean, it, it didn't come up in any of the testimony that I heard. I mean, there was concern regarding standardization and transparency and additional resources, but as far as the connection to the borough president and the council members, I think folks are more concerned about their lack of knowledge in the, the appointment process and how the appointment process could be different depending on the board and the borough, but not necessarily who is involved in that process. The, the reason I was asking primarily is because um, much of the criticism is uh, that whenever someone gets on the board, they're usually voting in line with whatever the borough president or a council member wants with respect to a project it gets a little bit dangerous in, in that sense. Because it, on one hand, the community may not want something, but then the community member, board member who's on the board will basically be voting kind of against what the community apparently kind of wants. So that is, that, that's sort of been like the common criticism that I've heard about boards and then um, They just want to, be, um, knowing that the current boards uh, were created by a charter in 89, and no revision of that has been done except that it has, in many cases, not served the communities as well as it should because many communities have changed since then. Um, so if you would come and I like to use my community so nobody said you said anything that you shouldn't have said. Um, when the growing Caribbean American community was coming, um, everybody would say to us, when you already own the houses and the businesses, why do you want to be in politics or be naming people who's going to put us down? And we said we want to have our own voices. And I think from hearings that we had, especially in Queens, there were many um, communities who talked about their growth 
of the Asian community and that they would apply every month for or every time to be on the community board and they never get appointed. And we are looking at ways in which to correct some of that, which is one of the reasons um, we are looking at term limits. If I appointed somebody and I spent 10 years in the city council, they should be ready to move off when I move out of office and give somebody else an opportunity to come and serve and that means as the community changes, we would be more likely to get somebody that is a new resident to be a part of the process and that's one of what we, I was pushing as part of, of um, civic engagement that people are aware of the power they have, even just sitting on a community board and then to encourage people to come to community board meetings even if they're not appointed so they hear and know what's happening in their communities. Okay. This gentleman and then well, thank you very much uh, for uh, inviting uh, Athletic Media. And uh, I, I also believe that if you uh, ignore the local ethnic media, so you, I believe that you ignore the uh, local communities, like ethnic communities in the city, which is very important to participate in this uh, election process, I believe. But my question is also this, that uh, uh, how can the commission amend the constitution uh, last time, and uh, what was the ratio of the voters of New York voters uh, uh, from a city like, eight, I think, 8.8 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, uh, city of voters. So uh, how many how many people, how many uh, voters participated in the uh, last uh, amended uh, charter of this commission? Oh, the, the charter vision be before the art for this one? Um, the last Charter Vision Commission was in 2010. That was, you may remember, uh, the Term Limits Commission. They had a couple of other issues on there, but the, 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 <laughs> that's what everyone was focused on. Um, I'm not sure, uh, the, the questions pass. I'm not sure I could say, though, um, sort of the ratio or the numbers of people that participate. Last time? 1.4 million. 1.4 million. Okay. It's out of about four odd million registered voters. Yeah. I'm Gabriela with Latin News, with Impact Latin News. Sorry. Uh, my question is regarding um, civic engagement. What type of, in, of innovative programs are possible to come out with uh, out of this civic engagement initiative? That's a good question. I think that uh, it's hard to, I, what I would say is I think that we would look to the commission to be innovative and to receive input from the greater community, including the folks in this room, as to ways into which they can get people to be civically engaged. So I think that this should be thought of as the laboratory for innovation in terms of civic engagement. So I, there's nothing in the that we're going to put in the mouth that's going to talk about any innovations besides the budgeting process, um, which is going to be expanded or, or or in addition to what the city council already has, which is fairly innovative. But I think that we expect to see a lot of new ways to tackle the lack of civic engagement in the city. More specifically on the Latino community, is there any any expectation you have from the Latino community as part of the initiative? Yeah, I mean, the, the language access piece, uh, both in the Civic Engagement Office and throughout, and then the community board side, really speaks to the growing communities, not only the, the Latino community, but all the other communities in the city, which we look to engage, even if they're not English English language dominant. Right? We want to speak to folks in languages that they feel comfortable speaking, in producing materials, in which they feel comfortable in 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 reading and communicating with them in the the way they feel most comfortable. In. So, I think we look to engage all communities, and really eliminate the barriers that, that currently exist. I have a question for any of you all. Um, 
to the extent that we're covering candidates who are going to be on the ballot in the general election in November, um, is it considered out of place and permissible in any sense to sort of press them on which ballot questions they are for or against and sort of encourage them to make it part of their ongoing outreach? Because, you know, we don't want to end up reporting this as if, as if it's disconnected from why everybody else is asking people to go to the polls on November 6th. I mean, I think an interesting one is is the proposal on campaign finance. I mean, the, like, the way that I would think about that question is is and, and, um, it's a step towards taking big money out of out of politics in, in municipal elections. It's, it's pretty substantial. It's a sixty percent cut in contribution limits um, across the board for municipal offices for participants. So um, that's pretty impactful. Um, I, it, it seems. It's, it seems like, I think, from our commission's perspective, like um, something that, that people would want to weigh in on. Um, there are some restrictions on what city officials can, um, can say. For instance, the commission can engage in um, uh, education and outreach and explain the proposals and why we made particular choices, but can't do um, express advocacy. So we can't say, vote for proposal one. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, but people can certainly sort of t talk about the merits of them and also do express advocacy in their personal capacities. Are, are you all in touch with any of the um, any of the candidates who are going to be on the ballot in November? Or is it, uh, you're there again. I don't want to ask you to cross any lines you're not supposed to cross. But. Um, several of them came and testified at the at our hearings. Yeah, and mm -hmm. and, and shared on the council members, um, some our presidents, the controller. Um, so they've they've very much weighed in um, campaign finance on community boards and a couple of aspects. Okay. Other questions, folks? Bernice Green and Time Press. Um, my background is um, PR, CBS News, and CBS Entertainment. I want to ask each one of you, what is it that you want or expect from all of us, each one of you? What I expect from each of you and from all of you is to educate our communities about okay what I would what I would like from each of you and all of you is to educate our communities about the power <coughs> they have as voters and the way in which they can participate fully as citizens in the community and now more than ever. I think we need to be able to make sure that they understand that you are news persons and that there is no fake news within our communities. We speak truth to power. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I agree. <laughs> I, I, uh, yeah, I always agree with Dr. Clark. I think that, um, I, I mean, I think what Dr. Clark said is, is correct. I mean, if, if, the common thread in these uh, proposals are increased civic engagement. Um, we would look for that to be reported, uh, to have people out to vote, um, and to be and to know that this is a unique moment where they can vote directly on an issue, not just on a, on a candidate. So. And I think to add to that, I think um, see us as a resource, and uh, especially I think, uh, and I don't know if I'm stepping out of bounds by saying that we would invite you all to reach out to the staff, to the executive director, and maybe even um, brainstorm on some ideas of uh, different ways to educate the community. I mean, people don't receive their news simply by reading the news. Um, the news also holds forums, they hold uh, public events. Um, and so I think in as much as, I mean, I know capacity is also limited, but um, in, the, in, in, in so much as there are opportunities to educate and engage the community in different ways through your platforms. I think that we would we would encourage that. I had a last question. Is um, participatory budgeting going to um, fall within the civic engagement rubric or is it going to end up somewhere else? Yes. Okay. And, and that's, um, how, just briefly, how, how would it differ from what we see right now, which is kind of optional by, I think, about a third to a half of the council? Um, the, the biggest 
difference. <laughs> the biggest difference with the citywide proposal is, is um, well, I mean, first that it's, that it's citywide, so everyone has the opportunity. Um, the community boards would be involved um, to some degree to, in the way that council members are involved in, in council man activity. Um, it would be implemented through the Civic Engagement Commission and um, it would be, it, there would be a certain amount of, of capital funding each year that would be allocated to be distributed in that way. So in a way, it, it is, it's similar to the, the council model, but just universal um, by community district and with community board involvement. Okay, interesting. We have a question. Uh, what's the timeline for implementing, oh, sorry. sorry. What's the timeline for implementing most of these um, proposals? For instance, campaign finance limits, um, and the other programs that they were established? It's going to vary by proposal. Um, like for instance, with, with participatory budgeting, we have to link it up with a budget cycle. So we're, we're, we're trying to figure out how quickly that can be, that can be implemented. Um, and so there's not, a, there's not a uniform implementation date. The, the voters will vote um, on the questions and they'll be adopted or not. And then each of the, the uh, the proposals, which, which, again, are like um, like a piece of legislation, will have different uh, effective and implementation dates. Okay, um, we've got a lot to talk about. We'll have to do that among ourselves, folks, it's including following up on some of the proposals we heard. But um, for now, I want to um, thank the commissioners and Matt and his staff for uh, putting this together for us. I certainly learned. A bunch of stuff and this is going to be part of the discussion between now and November and we uh, we thank you for taking some time to be with us today thank you. okay